He gave me something that said short and sweet, uh, but uh, he was born in Arab, Alabama, uh, attended and graduated from Faulkner University, receiving both a BA and an MA degree in biblical studies. Uh, he and his wife, Deborah, have been married for 20 years, and they have four children, one son and three daughters. He serves as the minister of the Rock Creek Church of Christ in Warrior, Alabama, and he's been working in the ministry for 23 years. He's a frequent speaker on lectureships and youth events and gospel meetings, and has been published in a number of the periodicals of our, our brotherhood. And we're grateful to have him with us tonight. And he's going to be speaking to us on how to develop a winsome attitude. And so let's give him our full attention. And I know we'll profit by our time being together here this evening. What do you think of when you get bad news? Do you think that the world's over? Do you go to an immediate gloom and doom scenario? Do you think about the worst case scenario? Do you always put yourself in that attitude, that mindset uh, that is defeating? Some people do. It's kind of the way people program themselves. One of the greatest things about us as human beings, however, is that we have what is known as self-control. Now, it's a thing that we need to work on, a thing that we need to develop, but I am firmly convinced, and I hope everybody here tonight will understand here in a few moments that God wants us to be optimistic, positive people in a negative world. Because the world as a whole desires to kind of have a negative connotation towards everything. Most people get a kind of a gloom and doom scenario when anytime anything bad happens. But we need to be the people that are optimistic. And I've used this illustration many times before, but I want to kind of share it with you as we begin our thoughts tonight. There were two sons to this lady, and she had a son, they were twins. One was totally negative, everything in life was bad. The other one, on the other hand, was always optimistic, always positive. There is a no way that he could find anything negative going on in the world, and no matter what happened, he always had an upbeat personality, and everything was going to be great and wonderful. Well, on their birthday, the mom said, well, you know what, today I'm going to fix it. Today I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make my pessimistic, negative son this the best day of his life. He's going to be happy all day. He's going to be looking at great things, and I've got it all set up in his room. And said, my, negative, or my optimistic son, I'm going to take him, and I'm going to make him where he's going to have a bad day. So she goes in and she sets the scenario up and she says, boys, happy birthday, your presents are in your room. So she goes up and gives them a few moments to kind of go and she goes and she leans in really close at the door of the negative son. And inside she's anticipating, hearing screams of joy and happiness and great, great and wonderful, I mean just great positive energy coming out of there. But instead when she gets close, she hears the boy inside Sobbing. Sobbing. And she goes inside and she says, Son, what is wrong? Why are you crying so? Oh, Mom, this is the worst day ever. This is the worst day of my life. And she says, But son, I have filled your room with every imaginable toy that I could purchase at the toy store and wrapped it for you. You have everything that a little boy would want. And he goes, But Mom, you don't understand my shelves won't hold all these toys and, and, and all my friends will come over here and they'll break them. And, and this is just the awfulest, worst day of my life. And then suddenly down the hall she hears shouts of joy. Shouts of joy. And she quickly goes down here and she opens the door of her optimistic son and in his room up about waist deep is manure. I said manure. This, this is manure. Waist deep. And he is digging through the manure with all that is within him. And she goes, son, what is wrong with you? Don't you see that in your room is manure? Yes, mom, this is the greatest day of my life. I can't wait. She says, son, what is wrong with you? Mom, if there's this much manure in this room, there's got to be a horse in here somewhere. <laughs> we need to be the people that in negative situations still have what our title is inside a winsome attitude. Now the word winsome is not something that we use very often in our world today. And in fact, I'll just be straight up with you, I can honestly say that this is the first time I believe I've ever used it in a sentence, in a sermon, in anything in my entire life when Jason gave me this title. And I said, a winsome attitude. Thank you very much, Brother Jason. I appreciate this. I think he's getting back. Y'all can tell him this story. The first time I met Jason was not at Faulkner University where we attended school together. That was the first time that I recognized him. The first time that we actually met was on a basketball court 
in Holly Pond, Alabama, when my team beat his team by two points to move on to the championship round that we won that year. So I thought maybe in a way he might be giving me a little gig to get back by putting this word in my vocabulary. But the word winsome is a great word. It's a word that we need to learn the meaning of. When we look at it, it is defined as this. Cheerful and lighthearted. Engaging. Having and showing a good mood or disposition. There's some words that are synonymous with it. Hopeful, optimistic, happy, joyful, gratified, merry, pleased, and we could continue on. And some words that are antonyms for it are gloomy, disheartened, downcast. The text that we're going to be studying is found in the book of Philippians chapter 4. And I hope you'll get your Bibles out, but I also hope that you'll pay close attention to the screen. Because tonight up on the screen, what I'm going to be showing for you is the amplified version, the amplified Bible of this text. And basically, um, I would not necessarily recommend using the Amplified Bible for a Bible study with a person who's outside of Christ. It's kind of wordy. It expands thoughts out. It kind of drags things out. And one of the key books that it uses in that dragging out is Thayer's Greek-English lexicon to pull some additional thoughts out. However, for a Christian who's working towards maturity, that's what I can kind of consider myself, working towards maturity, I highly recommend parts of it. It really puts some new insights in. And as we read these verses, they're familiar to us. They are verses that we've heard over and over and over again. And tonight in our time together, we're just going to basically break these down. I'd like to just discuss these things and put into the mindset from the Apostle Paul telling the church at Philippi exactly how they're going to be able to keep a winsome attitude. He didn't put it necessarily in those words, but it is very interesting that in the Amplified Version, the word winsome appears. So that kind of helped me to kind of pick my text out as well. Uh, doing a little study. But as we open up, we would say from Philippians 4 verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The Amplified says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Delight. Gladden yourself in Him. The hope for the world. And if we're going to be people who are truly optimistic, we need to understand that our merriness and our joyfulness is not going to come from within, but rather our merriness and our joyfulness are going to come from within when we give ourselves wholeheartedly to God. It would have been very easy for Paul the Apostle to have kept what he was doing, even seeing Jesus on the road to Damascus, and that life-changing experience for him. It would have been easy for many of the Apostles to turn back and go back to Judaism and serve it. It had been many things for them to be able to go back. And to me, one of the saddest chapters in all the Bible is John chapter 6. Whenever there's a great multitude of people who go and leave Jesus, and He turns to the apostles, those twelve, and says, Are you also going to leave? And in verse 66 they say, Where shall we go? You have the words of life. They understood what Jesus could give to them. The salvation, the eternal life, the spiritual blessings. But what we also need to understand is that true happiness is only found when we can rejoice in the things of God. When we can rejoice in the ways of God. When we can rejoice even though the world may be working against us with holding on to the idea that God is with us. And no matter what happens to me today or tomorrow or for the rest of my life, the God of heaven will be able to give me everything that I need to make it through this day. And if not, then... God will give me a reward of my eternal life in heaven. God is with us. He walks with us. He sees where we are going. He knows the temptations that are going to occur to us in that day. And according to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, He sets it up so that we can be successful in every single one of those temptations and overcome the trend triumph over the devil. But we need to be glad in Him. To me, the most miserable person in all of the world is a person who is trying to live for Christ a few days a week or a few hours a day and trying to live in the world the rest of the time. Because they are trying to divide their life into two things that are so opposite that they can't ever become congruent or equivalent. They can't ever match. They can't ever mesh up. And we need to gladden ourselves in Him. Again, He says... Rejoice. Writing from prison. Rejoice after being beaten and shipwrecked and losing the things that he had strived for in his young life. 
changing his aim and goals and ambition almost in a midlife time. Doing in what God even has said through the words Jesus Himself said, I must show Him what great things He must suffer for my name. And yet in all of that, Paul says rejoice. Why? Because he is glad in Christ. The things of Christ appeal to him far more than the things of the world. It's not something that just automatically happened on the road to Damascus. It's not something that just occurred magically and transformed. Nobody hit him with a magic wand. He wasn't hit with some kind of great spiritual sword or something that changed and transformed his life. But instead, he learned to be glad in Christ. Seeking spiritual things. You see, the winsome attitude comes from looking at the things of this world as they really are. It's all temporary. It is. It's all temporary. Pain, even in its greatest extent, is temporary. Some of you say, well, Mike, what do you know about pain? Well, you may not be able to tell it right now, but uh, nine months ago, I completely severed my Achilles tendon in half. Let me let you know something. I know a little something about pain. Because in that moment, I promise you, I thought somebody had shot my leg off. That's how bad it hurt. And then the rehab, and I'm still rehabbing. It's a year-long recovery. I won't be able to run or to jump on this leg until October 15th of this year. And then if I get the clearance from a doctor, I'm going to be able to start running again. And I long for that. I run with my wife. It's something that we have missed out on because I can't run with her. And she is not going to walk because she's trying to get in exercise and shape to do 5Ks and the things that she loves to do. And so I've missed some time with that. There's some things that go on. We all suffer physically in this world, but you know what? It's temporary. Jonah lives with me. He's my son. Jonah is a big, strapping, young, 17-year-old boy. And he likes to wrestle with me. He likes to try to throw me around. And I enjoy greatly throwing him around, but I haven't been able to do that for a while. But I keep telling him this. October 15th is coming, son. October 15th is coming. And when that day gets here and I get my clearance, you just better watch out. Because all this smack talk that you've been doing over this last year is going to come back to haunt you. You see, things pass. Time passes. Difficult times will come and go. The things of this world will come and go. We've all had new things that grew old. We all had things that we thought would give us great satisfaction in life, yet they fade away. In Christ, we understand fully things of this world are temporary. And the things of the Spirit are eternal. Eternal. They last. They have great power. They are the things that get us through and strengthen us in times when the world says you can't be strengthened. They comfort us in times when the world says you can't be comforted. How many times have people, especially in all kinds of professions, whether they are in the medical profession, and they go, you know what, we just don't know what else to do. It's in God's hands now if they're honest. And that's the only place they can turn. You see, that is the development and understanding of rejoicing and becoming glad in Christ. Let all men know and perceive and recognize your unselfishness. A wholesome, winsome attitude is an attitude that denies self. It's always interesting to me when Jesus says to His disciples and said, this is how you follow Me. If anyone will come after Me, let him take up his cross and follow Me, right? No, I skipped a part. I skipped a part. Deny himself. The unselfishness must come. There must become a thing where we also understand that this earthly life that we live is also temporary. The things that we're going through in life are temporary. I mean, let's just be honest. You look at me. I had hair once. I had a lot of hair. It was soft. It was nice. Now it's gone. You know? I had great athletic skills. Well, pretty good athletic skills. And they fade a little bit as time goes through. It's part of the thing of life. We grow old. We see that. We lose that youthfulness that we have. It's temporary. We lose self. But there's a part of us that is eternal. What are we going to feed? What are we going to take care of? And when we sit here and we begin to think about this life as being the temporary state and our eternal place being with God in heaven, then the selfishness will easily fall away because we are becoming selfish, but selfish in a good way. We are selfish for spiritual things. We want those more than we want the physical things. And that's exactly where God wants us to be when we are willing to cut off the selfishness, the things that are temporary, 
the physical things and seek those things that are above, then we will be the people who recognize and perceive the unselfishness. But notice how it's spread out here, how it's expanded. Your consideredness, the forbearing spirit. What is it about? Everybody's going to have difficult days. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We've heard that. What does that mean? Well, that means we help each other out. But often we don't go ahead and read down a couple of verses to verse 5 where it says, every man will have to bear his own burden. That doesn't mean uh, in contradiction to verse 2 where people can help us with our burdens. What it means is this. Every man, every woman, every child, every person that walks upon this earth are going to have bad days. How are you going to go through those bad days? Are you going to have a winsome attitude? Are you going to have an attitude that looks and sees things in this life as being temporary? One of the greatest statements ever made is this. This too will pass. This too will pass. Things of this life, they end. They have a beginning, they have an end. Eternity does not. And we've got to look at ourselves as those eternal creatures. The Lord is near. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming soon. In relative of time, we may not be able to predict that day, and we cannot. God Himself is the only one who knows. But we find solace in this whole mindset. The Lord is coming. You know, uh, not too long ago, we had a lot of people, and you know, with all the heat waves going on right now, what I like to call is people who are overly concerned about the environment. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a conservationist. Uh, my family eats all organic food. You can call us weirdos and all that good stuff if you want to. It's fine. We uh, try to take care of ourselves. We try to give back to the thing. We have a, a natural gas uh, heater for our water and stuff. I mean, we're trying to do all this stuff to try to do, be conservationist. I try to be that. So don't get me wrong with what I have to say. But there are some people who go to the extreme with it. They say, oh, if we don't cut carbon emissions by 75% in the next five years, you know, the earth's going to be destroyed. Oh, if we don't do this and cut back here, uh, we're going to lose all of the grain forests down in South America. We won't have enough oxygen and people are going to die. You know, there's some people up in Maryland today who wish they had tap water because that's gotten cut off well because the supplies run down. We can have a lot of panic going on, but I, I'm going to tell you a little secret. The world's not going to be destroyed because of an environmental disaster. The world's not going to be destroyed by some kind of nuclear holocaust. The world is not going to be destroyed by the zombie apocalypse. This world is going to be destroyed by the one who created it. And his name is God. And when Jesus comes again, that's going to happen. I find solace in that. Now, some people sit there and go, whoa, man, you've got to be kidding me. But the solace that I find in that, the hope that I find in that, the encouragement that I find in that is this simple fact. When that moment comes, I get to go home. I'm glad one person's ready to go to. We should amen that. That should be something that causes us to be motivated. The Lord is near. The Lord is at hand. The day of the Lord is at hand. It is close. Closer than whenever the world was created. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to happen before I physically die. I'm not going to say that it won't happen tomorrow. I'm not going to say that it won't happen in about five minutes before I'm done with this lesson. But that should give us an attitude that says, the Lord is in control. God is the one who can help. God is the one who knows all things. God is the one that all things, as Romans 8 and verse 28 says, all things work together for the good. To us, to us who love the Lord. To us who are called according to His purpose. We just need to find that solace in the fact that the Lord is near, that He is coming, that He is here with us and will be with us. Verse 6. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. As I was walking in, and some of you may not have noticed, but there's a really interesting bulletin board that proves this point. Right outside here in your foyer. It's got this guy sitting at this desk, and it's got all these things, anxiety, financial worries, bills, all this stuff. And it's got two little birds that are sitting on the windowsill looking in there. If you had not checked it out, you need to go by. And whoever put that bulletin board up, thank you for the perfect sermon illustration for tonight. I appreciate it. But it goes in there and it says, quotes from Matthew chapter 6 and says, Don't worry. Consider the birds of the air. They don't store up in barns. They don't build houses. 
They don't have investment plans. They don't have retirement funds. And God takes care of them. Don't you think you're worth more than birds? Now that's the Mike Wisnett commentary version on that last part. Don't you think you're worth more than a bird? God made you in His image. No other creature in all of the universe is made in His image except for us. We do not need to fret. We do not to be over-anxious about anything. We do not have to have anxiety about anything. Why? Because the winsome attitudes lets us realize, but in every circumstance and in everything, by prayer and petition, our definite request. You want to have a winsome attitude? You need to become definite in your prayers. What do I mean by that? Your prayer doesn't need to be, well, God, I thank you for everything, and give me everything. Amen. That's not what it's about. It is about you asking for things specifically in your life. You making a plan. You having a desire to be right. You having a desire to do what God needs you to do. You having a desire to be what you need to be for your family, for your congregation, for the kingdom of God as a whole. To go in and fulfill and to reach out and to evangelize. To go in and do good works in the community. You need to be a person who is prayerful of specifically about what you want to try to accomplish for God and with God. Definite request. Have you ever really broke down the Lord's model prayer that He gave in Matthew chapter 6? And seen about the specific things that He asked for? And how definite they were? How specific they were in trying to teach His disciples this is how you ought to pray? See, we need to be the people that understand really truly the power of prayer. The power of prayer does not come in our asking. The power of prayer comes in our believing that what we have asked for, we will receive. That's the power of prayer. When we ask of something from God, we go into the book of James, chapter 1 and 2. How many times in that book? How many times in those two chapters? If you go back and you study it and you look at it, we don't have time to get into that into our lesson this evening. You go in there and you see how God says we need to ask. If any of us lacks wisdom, ask of God who gives to all men liberty. Don't let a man think that he'll receive anything from the Lord that is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways, but yet we ask in faith. The idea of saying to this mountain, be moved from here to there, is not so that we can watch the spectacle of a mountain moving from here to there, but when we ask God and we have that faith as that grain of the mustard seed, and we say to this mountain, you move from here to there, we've turned our back and we're walking a different direction because in our mind before the first pebble moves on that mountain as God moves it, it's already moved where we need it to be. That's the faith that we must have. That is the attitude that we must have. That not only God will do what we ask Him for, but it is done as we move forward. Yes, in God's will. Yes, with God on our side. Yes, the things that God needs. I mean, don't sit there and go, and again, James emphasizes the idea of those unselfish prayers versus the selfish prayers. I mean, if I go and pray, God, I want a billion dollars tomorrow. Well, what do you want a billion dollars for? Well, I want a new Lamborghini. And a new mansion and you know a really big boat, you know, like a cruise ship, you know, that'd be nice. Those aren't things that I need for God. But instead, with everything, with those definite requests, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. Continual. James chapter 5, the effectual fervent. That's a continual prayer of a righteous man avails much. 1 Thessalonians 5. Pray without ceasing. Continually making our request make known to God. What is it about? It is not just something where I use God. I saw a great son driving down and said, uh, turning to God, don't do it as a last resort. Do it instead as a first response. No matter what happens, in all circumstances, in all things, in all ways, we should turn to God. Why? Because that lets me have that attitude that I truly, as 1 Peter chapter 5 and 7 says, I cast all my cares, all my anxieties upon Him. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here saying if you say, man, you know, I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned about the spiritual well-being of the world. I'm concerned about the church as a whole and some of the directions that things are going. I'm concerned about this. That is not what I'm talking about. 
What I'm talking about is the paralyzing fear, the paralyzing anxiety, the paralyzing worry that comes into some people's lives because instead of trusting in God that things will work out for the best, instead they try to do it all on their own. They think that they have to depend upon their power and their work and what they can do. And we realize we are all frail humans that have weaknesses and have shortcomings. And on a daily basis, we disappoint each other and our God. Yet, when we look to our God, we understand that if I have that thanksgiving and that penitent heart and that continual coming to God, requesting the things that I need in my life, my God not only will provide, my God will provide, as the psalmist said in Psalm 23, until our cup flows over. That's the God that we serve. We continue on to verse 7. And God's peace shall be yours, that tranquil state of soul assured of its salvation through Christ. How valuable is your salvation? The winsome attitude of God says basically this, if I'm in a right relationship with God, it doesn't matter about anything else that's going on in my world whether I have physical difficulties, mental difficulties, emotional difficulties, financial difficulties, no matter what is going on, if me and God, if God and I, if we are right, if we are together, if I'm in that state of salvation, then all things else in this world, everything else in this world can just go on by because that is the only thing that really truly matters. In the end of life, billionaires will give their billions up to live a few more days. People who have gone in and get great achievements would give those up to just prolong that physical life. Except for those who have found that relationship with God, that salvation state, who've obeyed that Gospel. And they long for the day when they meet their Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but if tonight, at this moment, if the clouds were to roll back, we hear the great trumpet sound of the Archangels, the shout of those guys, and Christ is coming back. I'm going to probably crash through a window just to get outside to see it. Because there's not a door close by. There's an exit door. I'll take that exit door right there. Quickest exit out, running to see it. We've got to long for it. We've got to desire it. It's got to be the thing that is more important than anything else in our life to deny that unselfish physical nature to get in instead become selfish spiritually for the things of God and develop that salvation. And as we move through, and so fearing nothing from God. What does that do? Perfect love casts out fear, right? What am I afraid of? If I'm a person who's in a safe state with God at this moment, am I going to fear God? No, we're going to have that surely, that spirit of adoption that Romans chapter 8 speaks of where we cry, Abba, Father, verse 15. We aren't going to have that bondage of fear again. We're not going to have that bondage of slavery. But instead, we are the people, even though we have sinned, even though we have drifted from God, as the prodigal father looked out and saw his son a great way off, we know when we have sinned and we even fall away from God that we should have a confidence to come back to God and a confidence to regain and enjoy the joy of the salvation that God offers to us. And since we don't have to fear God, we fear nothing of this world. Nothing of this world. Jesus encouraged, encouraged His disciples in Matthew chapter 10. Do not fear those that can destroy the body, but cannot destroy the soul. What is it really all about? Well, to me, Romans 8 and verse 31 puts it even better. If God is for us, who can stand against us? I don't know about you, but it would be awesome to know that no matter what battle I went into, that I would be able to win that battle. That no matter what fight I went into, I would be able to win that fight. And the God of heaven enables all of us to win every battle. We've just got to be the people who act in faith. Who understand that when we have that salvation in that state from God, that we stay in there, we walk in the light, as 1 John 1 and verse 7 teaches us so clearly. That we don't have to fear God. And if I don't have to fear anything from God, I don't have to fear anything. Continuing on, and being content with our earthly lot, whatever sort that is. Whatever sort that is. Contentment with physical things is uh, hard to get in. 
We look at it on the television set, and what do they tell you? Well, you know, sorry guys, PlayStation 3 is not good enough anymore because what's coming out pretty soon? PlayStation 4. And probably in about six or seven years, if that long, maybe three, probably more like two, there'll be PlayStation 5. Why? We've got to have something better. We've got to have the better iPhone. Now the iPhone 5, which will be replaced pretty soon, as soon as they get it with the iPhone 6. The Galaxy S is no longer any good. They've got to have the Galaxy and move on up in steps. Can't get just an iPad anymore. Now you have to have the iPad Mini. Now you have to have what, Daniel? I don't know what the next near great thing is coming up, but he'll be the first guy in line to buy one. Right, Daniel? Appreciate you, brother. Why? The world sells us with a bill of goods that we've got to have the latest, greatest, best, wonderful, awesomest new toy that's been created. Yet, God says, when we can learn to be content with our earthly lot. Now, I'm not talking about buying the new stuff. I'm talking about being satisfied where we are. You know, there's a lot of wisdom in stopping and smelling the roses. There's a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of solace. There's a lot of peace that comes in enjoying where you are in life. All too often, we're in such a big hurry to grow up. We're in such a big hurry to get to this stage in life. We're in such a big hurry to get to this point here and this point there that we can't just stop. This Friday morning, about 3.30, I'll be cruising down I-20 heading towards the airport. Going to Jamaica. It's a place I've learned to love. Not the beaches that you get to see on all the wonderful, awesome uh, resort that they advertise about Jamaica. I'm going to what I call real Jamaica. Where you have people that are 85% unemployed. And people that take care of each other. And literally, I'm not kidding, literally 50 times a day, when something goes wrong, you hear people there go, no problem, ma. That's no problem, man, for you people from Alabama. And they mean it. They mean it. The wheels can fall off. The plan can go awry. And the Jamaican's answer to everything is, no problem, we'll fix it. No problem, we'll take care of it. No problem, we'll walk. No problem, we'll get it done. May not get done today, maybe it'll be tomorrow, maybe it'll be next week. No problem. They accept that lot of life. Things happen. We don't get all the toys that we want. We don't get the promotion that we thought we needed. We don't get the news from the doctor that we thought we would get. But instead we understand spiritually is the focus that we need to have. That peace which transcends all of our understanding shall garrison and mount guard now, I don't know about you, but to me, these two words appeal to me. I guess you could sit here and say I'm kind of got a little bit of a soft spot for the military. To garrison. To mount guard over your hearts. When we sit there and think about the word guard, we sit here and we think about one person maybe standing guard or whatever, but when I hear the word garrison, I'll tell you what I think of. I think of the men who guard the tomb of the unknown soldier in Arlington National Cemetery. If you've never done a study about their military regiment, you need to stop and go in. I could not be one of them. I'm too tall. Because to be in that guard, you have to be under six feet two. I'm six feet five. Doesn't happen for me. They make a vow, no matter whether they are in uniform, out of uniform, or whatever, that they will not smoke, they will not drink, and they will not curse. That's not any other military regiment in all of the services combined anywhere in the world. They dedicate themselves to doing one thing, training themselves in one way. If they have one button on their uniform that is out of place, they can be immediately taken out of duty and removed from that honored position. They put in a great deal of time, effort, energy to the minutest of detail. They are garrisoned to guard one place. Rain, shine, 365 days a year, seven days a week. God does not take off in garrisoning and mounting guard over us. 
We talk about 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Not in, under. God doesn't want us to be in His hand. God wants us to be under His hand when the bad days come. When the trials come. When the difficult days and the difficult hours are there. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that at the right time that He may exalt you and lift you up. You see, all too often we don't understand about God and I know I don't grasp it all the time, but He will mount guard over our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Have you ever thought really about the first part of the book of Job? Satan comes before God and I know we can sit here and have a great theological debate about the book of Job, but to me I want to just point out one very simple concept from that very beginning. God says, have you seen my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. Fears God with all of his house. And Satan comes to God and he says, you have put a hedge around him and I can't touch him. which transcends all understanding, shall garrison and mount guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You want protection from the evil one? Have the peace that passes understanding that comes from that winsome attitude that God wants you to have. That you accept your lot wherever it is in life. You accept what's going on around you. And instead of being overly concerned or having great anxiety or worried about like Chicken Little that the sky is falling and the world's coming to an end, instead you know that the God of heaven has got that button and He's the one who's going to push the trigger to destroy the world. And when it does, it's for your benefit to take you home. And the God of heaven will garrison the winsome attitude. For the rest, brethren... Whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence and is honorable and seemly, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome, there it is, and gracious. If there is any virtue and there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh and take account of these things. Fix your mind on them. Fix your mind on them. What does that mean? Instead of hearing the negative things of the world, instead of hearing the, uh, and thinking about and focusing on the things that are going wrong in your life, instead of sitting there and looking out to the world and only seeing the negative things that are going on, instead, open your eyes and see the good. Why? James 1 and verse 17. Every good gift. Every perfect gift descends down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation nor shadow to change. James 1.17 reminds us of what God gives. Because when we look out into the world and all we see are the negative things, we see the bad choices that people have made, we see the moral corruption in this and the criminal corruption in that, and we see all the negative things, you know who we decided to focus our life upon? We are focusing our life upon the things and the works of the devil, not the things and the works of God. God is the giver of good. God is the one who wants good things to happen in every life. God gave His Son. He gave us the plan of redemption, the plan of the Gospel to save mankind. God is the one who helps us in our weaknesses, who helps us in our times of difficulty, who builds us up, who gives us strength, who gives us physical blessings, whether we are people who are good or people who are evil. The rain falls upon all. And yet, in our life, we aren't winsome. We aren't positive. We aren't optimistic because we look out into the world and we see the works of the devil and we almost think that the devil is going to win. But as we talked about out in the hallway this uh, very evening, I've read Revelation. And Revelation lets me know that the devil may seem to have won some of the battles, but in fact, he has lost everything miserably. Because in the end, God will banish him along with all those who have focused upon the bad things of this world and live their lives in it to a place of torment while in heaven where there's no more tears, 
and no more sorrow and no more pain and no more death. The God of heaven is reigning now and will reign then and all those who fall and call upon Him and humble themselves and seek His ways, that's where they will be. Why focus on the positive things? Why fix our minds on the things that are worthy of praise? Because then we see the things of God active in our world. Verse 9, Practice what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. He just didn't say one small thing. Practice what you have learned. Practice what you have received. Practice what you have uh, heard. Practice what you have seen in me. And model your way of living on it. What did he say? I'm trying to be a role model. He said it best in 1 Corinthians 11. One, imitate me because I'm imitating Christ. But he said, church at Philippi, you saw what I did when I came and I, I preached to you. And I labored with you and I worked with you in establishing the church and building you up. You saw the work that I did. You saw my labor of love. You saw all the things that I'm trying to do. You need to follow those things. Why has God left His Word for us? So that we could learn. So that we could see. So that we could hear. So that we would have something to model. That's what God knew that we needed. And we need to be people who are role models for each other. Role models for our friends and neighbors who are outside of Christ. Role models for those people who see us. Not because we want to lift ourselves up and say, look at me and look how great I am. But instead we say, look to me and see the Christ. My Lord and my Savior. Recently, <clears throat> there was a young man and he was baptized. And he had uh, gotten baptized before, and I use that term loosely because really he just got wet when he was six years old. And as we were studying and talking about this, this 18-year-old young man made a statement I thought really was very profound. He said, you know, I understood everything <clears throat> in my mind about Jesus being the Savior. He said, but I didn't have a clue what it meant to let Jesus be the Lord of my life. You know, a lot of people, they want God, Jesus to be their Savior. That's the easy part. Jesus being the Savior just means, man, I get my sins washed away, and that means, you know, that I'm going to go to heaven and everything's going to be fine. But the Lord part means I'm going to change the way I live. He's the Lord of my life. Now, the choices in life are not mine. They're His. That winsome attitude lets me go back and say, I want to be the role model. I want to understand all the things. I want to model my way of living on it. But the God of peace then... Untroubled, undisturbed well being, He will be with you. He will be with you. That is the God that we serve. He is the God that is with us. Psalms 46 and verse 1 The Lord is my refuge and my strength. He is a present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the mountains fall down into the seas, though the rivers rage, though the earth melts, we will not fear. Why? Because the God of heaven is with us. The God of heaven wants to be with you. The God of heaven wants to build you up. The God of heaven wants to strengthen you and give you all the things that you need to have a winsome attitude. So tonight, as we've studied this, I want to leave you with three tips. And I think my time is, is just about gone yet. I heard what I thought was a bell. But I want to leave you with these three things. The first thing is we can develop a winsome attitude because God will give us the tools that we need. God will give us the tools that we need. I'm just going to ask you a question. Uh, let's say I'm going to say tomorrow I need a little help and you volunteer to help me. I said, uh, we're going to go dig a ditch. How many of you are going to bring a shovel? Just raise your hand if you're going to bring a shovel. All right, awesome. Because this ditch is 30 feet wide and 20 feet deep, and it's going to be two miles long. You still want that shovel? You still want that shovel? No. Instead, why don't you say, I need an earth mover. If we're going to dig a ditch, let's dig a ditch. Often spiritually, we say, God, we're going to do great things together. Where's my shovel? And God looks at us and says, I've got earth movers. I've got earth movers. 
why are you want a shovel when you could run this earth mover that has tires that are taller than me? I can train you. I can give you whatever you need to accomplish this. God says go out and convert the world. God says go out and teach the Gospel. God says go and make a difference in your community. And all too often we're looking for the spiritual shovel instead of understanding that the God of heaven wants to give us the tools that we need to accomplish things in great ways, not in a minute way with our physical small bodies and hands. You see, all too often we look at the power that we have inside of us and we say, this is all that I can do. Yet Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to His power that is at work within us. You see, I don't have to rely upon me. And that's a really great thing. Because the winsome attitude that God wants me to have and the winsome attitude that I can develop and the winsome attitude that will help me to overcome every obstacle that the devil wants to throw at me, God will not only empower me to succeed, but to become, as Romans 8 says, more than a conqueror. Because through Him who loved us. We've got to be the people that understand God wants us to be super successful spiritually. The three S's. And we can have that attitude. We should develop a winsome attitude because it will help bring people to Christ. What are people in this world looking for? They're looking for people who aren't uh, rocked to their core by the things of this world. Now, I'm not sitting here saying whenever someone dies, you don't cry and grieve. Whenever bad things happen, you don't sit there and say, man, can't believe this happened. But I think our attitude in the grand scheme of things as we work in there shows a lot about where our trust is. Again, accepting that idea of our lot in life. Again, that understanding that God will help us and support us and so give us the things that we need in life. That is that winsome attitude where God says God will provide and it will help other people say, what's different about you? Why do you have so much confidence? How are you able to face this troubled time? How are you able to overcome this difficulty? How are you able to do this and receive the strength? And buddy, does that not just open the door to say, oh, it wasn't me. It was the God of heaven working through me. It was the God of help, heaven helping me. That's the winsome attitude that we need to have. and We must develop a winsome attitude to protect our souls and help us make it to heaven. What's the devil going to do? What's the devil going to throw at us? Everything he's got. Everything he's got. He's going to try to destroy us. That's his goal. He wants us to quit. He wants us to slow down. He wants us to become complacent. He wants us to become apathetic towards everything that is going on around us. Because in doing so, we not only lose the souls of those that we might influence, but our own soul is put at jeopardy and great risk. You see, how are we going to be able to overcome the obstacles of life? Oh, with a winsome attitude. How am I going to be able to make it through today with the winsome attitude that I'm positive, that I'm optimistic, that I'm empowered, that I am ready, that I am able because God gives me all the tools that I need to overcome. And one day heaven will be my home. Not because of what I do, but because of what the God in heaven is willing to do with, through, and around me. I just need to be the person who is constantly looking to see God at work. His invisible attributes, as the book of Hebrews puts in chapters 3, 5, 7, and 9. His invisible attributes that clearly display and show that God is real. Those are the things that we need to see. Those are the things that we need to focus upon. And the winsome attitude will come to us and needs to come to us. So that we will have a desire to go to heaven that supersedes all things. That we will stop focusing on the temporary things of this life and instead we will be the people who see the permanence of the eternal things of God. You see, the winsome attitude is not a popular thing in our society today. Because the things of earth won't produce it. The only thing that will produce it are the things of God. Thank you so much for your kind attention tonight. I appreciate it very much. The, the looks, the thoughts, the positive shakes of the head. But above all things, I hope and I pray for every person here that you will let God transform you by getting into His Word, by getting into specific and definite things in your prayer life, and let God empower you 
Let God help you. Let God strengthen you. And turn to Him with every light in life. And see that all things truly work together for good. We just need to be the people who continue to love the Lord. And continue to love His cause. And continue to love His church. And be called according to His purpose. And His way. And His strength. And His time. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Almighty God, our Father in Heaven, thank You so much for the power of Your Word to motivate us, God, to encourage us, to give us strength and comfort, especially in times of difficulty. Pray, God, that You'll help us to come to You each day with thankfulness and gratitude in our heart for the things that You've so richly blessed us with. But also, God, to take time to be patient, to see You, to see Your invisible attributes, to understand, God, that one day Your Son will return and take us all home. May that motivate us. May it cause us to do more for Your cause each and every day. God, help us to turn to You for strength, to give us the tools that we need to accomplish Your great work that You've called us all to do through Your Gospel. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we ask. Amen.